something that I had to learn pretty early on, not just in the dungeon, but when I went independent, is knowing where your boundaries are and stick to it. No amount of money can tempt you out of your boundaries. Welcome back to On the Horizon. This is Melrose Michaels. I am your host, and I'm here to share what's worked for me in building my adult creator business to try to make building yours just a little bit easier. Let's get into today's episode. I hope that you are all feeling a little bit submissive today because we have guest MX Tomi joining us to talk about our journey into dumb work, insights into the industry, client dynamics, and so much more. MX is gender neutral. So I'm going to refer to you as MX for the rest of this. And also, I believe you go by Mistress Tommy as well. So let me read your bio and give you the stage, Tommy. MX Tommy is an NYC-based Taiwanese dominatrix traveling internationally. She began in-person work in 2019 professionally at a Brooklyn dungeon, went independent during 2020, just a year ago, began the digital domination side of her empire. She now owns her own personal clip site, mxtomi.digital and produces kink and fetish content for her only fans lovingly dubbed tomi fans by her subs and she's been featured in hustlers xbiz and i want clips and was nominated as best fetish creator of the year in 2024 xbiz miami creator awards in her downtime tomi is a huge nerd and loves reading watching anime reading manga and diving into her current sci-fi obsession MX Tommy, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. And also, I need to know, what are you currently obsessed with sci-fi wise? I watched, I just watched um, Dark Matter on Apple TV and I'm, I am in love with it. <laughs> Hi, thanks for having me here. Um, I hosted a book club on my OnlyFans and I'm currently reading The InCal. It's a comic series. It's been really, really good. Oh, I'm obsessed. That's awesome. And a um, book club, that's so cool. Yeah, I have a lot of um, nerds on my OnlyFans, so in between like the sexy lives, I also have a lot of chill lives where I just hang out with people, and the book clubs have been very popular. That's so unexpected. I love that. I love that you give them like a bit of like your real life and your real hobbies and interests. I think that's so important. Yeah, I mean, I think a part of this is, and I know we're going to jump into questions, but because I came from the in-person space, like prioritizing connecting with subs especially when we're dealing with oftentimes right kinks and fetishes that can be really heavy and degradation and humiliation it's like it's even more important to balance that out with bringing them into a more like uh safe uh headspace where we can just talk as friends yeah yeah that makes me think of like the whole the aftercare and, and like some of those components to to dom work mm-hmm. Exactly. I think what maybe we could start this with is a little bit of background on you for anyone who's listening who's not familiar with you or your work. So I think maybe let's start with like what inspired you to become a professional dominatrix and how did that journey kind of begin? So I've always been a kind of kinky weirdo. My first turn on and this is like the very first memory I I had of like something interesting me was I must have been like younger than 10 and it's that scene in the matrix where Neo had the metal bug like going into his belly button and he's screaming and then his mouth disappears so images like that has always been implanted in me and throughout high school uh vanilla sex was never that interesting to me but if there was rope involved if there was someone who's you know begging then I would really you know get turned on I would get really interested in that Uh, so it was kind of a natural progression Um, I in college went on fed life and I was just meeting couples and people and talking uh, in anonymous chat rooms online to just figure out BDSM and explore myself and when I moved to New York it uh, and after seeing the New York kink scene which in my opinion is like the biggest kink scene in the US I I just knew that I had to try the dungeon and see like what's up in that kind of space and I I loved it that's amazing I love that you brought up the the neo scene for the matrix because I actually saw that I think you did a reel about it on your social because I remember watching it and, and thinking about that 
I think it's so cool how you can pinpoint a moment where something resonated like that for you. Because I, I, I think a lot of creators or performers kind of have a similar experience. So that for me is like, wow, that's really telling, like that that made such an impression on you. Yeah, I think for, I think doms are kind of born this way. Uh, I think kinky people are kind of just wired a little different. <laughs> Yeah, I can see that. I feel like I feel that too. Everything I gravitate towards, I'm like, I wonder how I got here. <laughs> uh, <good job. laughs> Are there memorable experiences from your career specifically that kind of shaped the dom that you've become today? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think the the first memorable experience was probably the first client I had in the dungeon because the dungeon format was you know people would call and then it's basically a walk-in situation whereas when i'm working independently there's a pretty extensive intake form and then a vetting process and you know it's scheduled ahead of time uh and there's also like a console call involved so in the dungeon it was a lot more fast paced and i just remember the the first client that i flogged and i was like all i know about this guy is his name and there's still chemistry happening and that was very surprising to me because I was used to prior to that kind of in a more, you know, uh, dominant uh, girlfriend situations where I'm dating, but the sex life is like a female led relationship and figuring out that you can also have that intensity in a DS dynamic within a confined space and within like a short period of time was pretty liberating. So I would say the first person I flogged at the dungeon. And then I've had some really amazing subs throughout my career that have supported me from day one for me to get to the place where I am today. Um, the very first sub I've ever seen, right, in 2019 when I started, he is still one of my subs today and he's exclusive to me. And every step of like career changes, every step of you know, my dominant style changing, he's been there to service me and to get me to the place I am today. So I really appreciate that like close cohort of people that I've built these like deep relationships with. I love that you brought that up. And because even as in my own career, like I have so some fans who have seen a lot of evolutions of my career. You know, like they've seen me go from like even premium Snapchat model to clip creator to fan site model and like kind of just evolve and grow like as a human just because, you know, I'm getting older, my priorities change, my my appearances change, like so much has shifted over the time. So when you talk about like the, that cohort of people or like those day one subs who've stayed with you, is there something you'd attribute, I guess, that depth of relationship with them mm -hmm too like is there something you feel like stands out that you do that builds rapport to that depth with a sub i think i i try to always do right by my submissives and i try to always do things in a very ethical way even if that means making um certain uh like short-term decisions that's not good commercially right and that means if there's a sub that, for example, I think sometimes in this industry, we tend to prioritize people who are whales and not prioritize people who can only give time and attention. And I think my like my way of approaching this work is like time and attention is gold also and figuring out ways to work within their limitations and their boundaries um, and understanding how to like navigate the kinks and fetishes responsibly, including aftercare has been really helpful to make it long-term sustainable. Um, and, and in general too, I, I, I am really passionate about this work and I'm constantly um, learning and constantly trying to hone my skills in big ways and in small ways. And I think they see that and they want to support that kind of person. If you're enjoying this podcast episode so far, please take one moment to share it with another one of your adult content creator friends because you know what the rule is here. We do not gatekeep and we want to make as many adult creators businesses as easy as possible. And you sharing this episode with them might do exactly that. Thanks so much in advance. You said something right a minute ago about like decisions that can be made short term, but maybe aren't like commercially 
good long term? Can you give like a, I guess, an example of something like that? Because I feel like creators listening might be curious, like what what that looks like or or, or why you made those decisions. Yeah, I, I think uh, because of the way I approach domination and I put uh, like the human connection at the forefront, that means my business is not uh, uh, eternally scalable, right? Like there will be a point where um, I need to figure out, do I want to scale up to more people or do I want to keep closer connections? And having to make that kind of decision as I expand and being okay with expanding very, very slowly to prioritize quality over quantity, that for me personally has been what's been most fulfilling for me and what's been most fulfilling for uh, my audience and my fans. Yeah, that, that makes so much sense. And, and you also talked about staying within the, the like submissive boundaries of what they can offer and kind of meeting them there. Like I, I too have some fans who they're not spenders there they may have never spent a dollar or a penny on me but I also believe that every fan as long as they're not like taking from you like in terms of like draining your energy or, or being excessive with things but I think every fan in terms of time and attention is also gold like even if you can't tip you can go and you can make sure you're liking every post or you're sharing the stuff I post or retweeting it like there's a value in engagement there's a value in in other things fans have brought to the table I, I used to have a fan that would help me do all my editing um at for a short time and he could never spend but he was able to offer me value in these other ways and i think a lot of fans are open to that if you're open to it as a performer so i love that you brought that up i think that's so valuable yeah i i absolutely agree right um and because I've taken this approach, there's been some really amazing surprises I've had. Like some fans have been making memes of me, right? Um, there's fans who have like been just kind of like on BDSM threads saying really nice things about me on Reddit. And it's got, it's, you know, I don't even have to talk, really talk about it. They're kind of proselytizing on my behalf because they, they like me. And I think that's kind of what happens when you have, uh, that kind of like relationship with with your audience and with your fan base. I've also had some artwork commissioned of me recently, which was really fun to see. Um, and that was also totally unexpected. And that was really cool to see too. I do love the the artwork and commission artwork stuff. It's really fun for me to see. Yeah, no, for sure. It's well, because you obviously care about art and like you love the aesthetics. Like even the, some of the things you're talking about being into like anime and manga, like there's a, a quality to commissioned artwork that's just so epic I, I love that too and those surprises mm -hmm. are like the things you you don't I guess naturally you don't expect obviously that's because they're surprises but they come out of these relationships as a byproduct and, and when we see creators who like yourself have this stuff coming and like you know commissioned artwork on their behalf or memes being made about them and and all of that it really speaks to the quality of the business you're running and I think that's that's fantastic and also unique because right now, most creators who are of substantial size, their only focus is scaling. And there are choices to be made and trade-offs in prices and costs that come with that. And also, you have to consider the business model you want to run. Like if you want to be a really massive creator, you got to realize like your DMs in, in the relationships that fans are trying to have with you, the access that they want is not going to be scalable. So then that brings other decisions and choices to be made. And it gets very complex very fast. So I love that you, you spoke about scaling slowly and, and doing it with depth because in reality, you could have a small group of fans that are highly qualified that would spend a lot of money or provide a lot of value without needing to have thousands of them. You know what I mean? Like you don't have to be a Radley Reed or a Lana Rhodes or Lena the Plug and have this massive audience to be successful in this business. And I think what you mentioned really speaks to that. Yeah, and I think every creator needs to find what works best for them, right? Um, and figure out like, do you want to scale or do you not want to scale? I just know for me personally, I don't want to scale forever. Like I want to hit a certain point where I have the lifestyle I want and I'm comfortable. And to be honest, like anything extra that comes from my fan site, it's going to go back into making really cool videos and doing really cool shit for my for my subs that I really enjoy, right? Like just having that freedom to be like, hey, I want to spend X amount on this really crazy photo shoot. Like I recently had this magical girl photo shoot. It was a whole day shoot. 
And I was like, this is just for me. I do not care if this makes any money at all. I just want to do this for me because I think it's fun. And I want to do like something that is an extension of myself. And I think people saw that and they it really resonated. Uh, and I have like a few subs who are like, if you make that into a t-shirt, I'm going to buy it. Which that was not the intention at all. I just came into it being like, I want to do something cool. And that's it. And I, I think people respond to that. Oh, I see. And I love that. And also the fans to be like, if you made this into a t-shirt, I would buy it. Like there's no better um, driver of like other things you can commoditize or other things you could build off of than what your audience is requesting. So like even that feedback alone is like, wow, that that is a potential other route you could go at some point. Um, that's that's epic. That's awesome. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I have I, I really do love my subs and my fans. <laughs> You can tell. You can tell by the way you run your business. I, you mentioned um, when we first kicked off being in New York and the kink and lifestyle uh, that is there, and it is one of the biggest and most prominent um, in the world. And I'm curious, like, how do you see the BDSM community evolving, especially in New York? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think the scene changed a, a bit uh, from after COVID. There was a lot of old dungeons that closed down during COVID, but in its place, a lot of new dungeons also uh, popped up. Uh, I think it's, I think we still have a really, really burgeoning uh, BDSM scene. There's always a lot of munches happening, kink parties. Uh, I'm going to one this Saturday. That's like Simdom Wrestling. One of my friends, Stasha Bon, is performing. And, you know, I, I think part of the appeal is to, in New York, if I'm not traveling internationally, there's so much inter international travel that goes into New York that there's uh, there's always like a fresh step, a fresh uh, set of like clientele and ideas that's flowing in the scene. And that's so convenient too, because it's, it, I mean, New York, Miami, LA, these are some of those like international hubs. So yeah, I could imagine, especially for in-person dom work, that that's just like a constant sales funnel for you. It is. Yeah, it is. And it's nice when I have subs that uh, travel into New York because I can't. Yes, I get a little tired of traveling sometimes. Um, in the last like year and a half, I've have had a month fully in New York. Like I've had one week constantly where I'm traveling somewhere to see a sub or doing a tour and doing some shoots. So it's nice to like I decided for this July and into like half of August, I'm going to just stay in New York. And even then, right, if I if I say I'm just staying in New York, subs can figure out ways to, to get there because there's always some kind of business opportunity happening, some kind of event, convention. And it's really easy to to find some excuse to to make it there. Yeah, I think that um, maybe people who are in the Dom or like the kink space aren't aware that you know subs could travel to their Dom or that these arrangements can be made in this way. Do you think that there's other misconceptions that like maybe people have about BDSM or professional domination or these kinds of kinks and fetishes? I think probably one of the bigger misconceptions, man, I've been so steeped in this industry, so it's hard for me to think about what do other people think about this industry now? Um, I think maybe it could potentially, you know, people thinking that, um, the DOM is always service topping. And I think a big portion of pro DOMs do service top. And there can be some wonderful service topping that's happening. But the majority of the time I find most DOMs operate in a way where they have their five kinks and fetishes they really like. And they tend to center their own pleasure within the work itself. It's never to a point where, you know, we're we're like catering to the sub or the client so heavily that we're denying our own agency or pleasure. I think that might be one of the misconceptions from the outside. And for that, I would just say, you know, do your research on the DOMs. If you want to serve this top, you can find someone in in that space. And if you want someone who like really has good chemistry with you, just do the research, you know, read their website, look at their, you know, digital content and you know, subscribe to their fan site to see if you have good chemistry first before jumping into something in person. Oh, that's fantastic adv advice. I, I hadn't thought, like, obviously, there's if I was a sub and I was looking for the right 
dom for what i'm seeking it makes sense to do the research it makes sense to subscribe to the content but i would also be curious like to to your point about service topping how how i could get the experience that i'm seeking from the dom that i'm i'm interested in so i'm wondering like can you describe kind of the process of creating a personalized experience for your clients and and how you go about something like that yeah definitely my website currently is down there's a, a transition happening for the domain but i have a pretty extensive intake form and right now just the email is up and my assistant has the form kind of written out by hand but i haven't i have a very detailed form around like what type of sub are you what's the psyche and the headspace that you are in when you're subbing right not every sub feels the same some subs when they're submitting they want to f they feel humiliated or degraded other subs feel like a teenager right like they're reminded of be being bullied in high school other subs want to feel like a footstool or a chair so i really try to get into like what is the headspace of the submissive when they're subbing so i know what that weakness is and then I ask about like kinks and fetishes, and then I dive into like what their limits are. Once that form is kind of like written out in a very concise way, I get on a console call to go over all of it and to talk about um, get, just getting in general, getting to know the sub a little bit better and why they uh, found this out about themselves. Um, and from there, that's kind of the raw clay that's I can now use to craft a theme, right? All of that information will indicate to me how long a session should be, what kind of outfits would be like a weapon I can use against them, uh, you know, the location, the lighting, the music, the temperature in the room. I love getting a scene down to a science so that the moment uh, a sub walks in, they're in my domain. They know exactly what is going to happen. And also there's enough safety in place so that I can surprise them and add things that will please me and make this the most pleasurable experience for myself. Uh, and that's kind of how I create that um, personalized like session space. And I, I really quite love crafting sessions that have like a there's a rising action, the climax, and then a, uh, you know, uh, what is it, uh, declining action, and which is the aftercare, and then kind of putting them back together to go back out into the world again. <laughs> I love that. I like that you almost have like that story arc to the experience because that that seems super unique to me. I, I haven't heard that widely talked about. I haven't heard other doms maybe like describe it in that way is that something you feel is very unique to you and an experience you like to provide that's something that i feel like a lot of uh, there's a few doms that i i look up to in their style mainly because it resonates with me I, everyone has a different style right which is why a sub should do their research on the dom style i'm a little bit more playful and i'm definitely sadistic and i like a storyline because it's interesting for me. I, I like seeing the, you know, the emotional changes that happens in a sub as the, the hours or whatever goes by. And I like building that relationship. Like I like building that um, psychological space up. Um, I, I wouldn't say I'm unique. I, I think uh, I have a style, but I'm sure there's other doms out there that do things like this too. And I wouldn't be surprised if, um, you know, they're, it's, it's out there. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned like in your experience that you like to leave a little room where you can still surprise your clients. What do you what do you mean like that? Like, is there can you give an example of something like that? Uh, so there's been clients where okay, so this is a story. I had a new sub recently, and on his form he only put like hugging and like anal play. Right, the moment he walked in and the way he was reacting. I just immediately, just from intuition, I was like, this guy's a sissy. I fucking know this man is a sissy from the way he's waving his ass for my for my cock right now. <laughs> you know, and I was like, okay, let's test it out. Let's see if he is. And I called him a good girl. 
well, he reacted well to that. And I was like, okay, he reacted well to a good girl. Let's try something else. I was like, you know, I, I was like, I, I don't want to call you by X anymore. I want to call you by this name. And he reacted well to that. And I was like, this is my end. And we just went hard on the sisification with the pegging together. Um, and, and it's things like that, right? Where if I see something that I can really draw out of them, that's going to be fun for me. I, I pull it out. If there's something that they're a little scared of sometimes, and I see I'm in a, I'm in a mood to kind of like push that limit and we have that trust built, I'll push it, you know, if it's, if they said, I'm, uh, you know, I, I have a hard time with, uh, caning too much. I'll bring out a cane and I'll just kind of lay it there, right? I don't have to use it, but it's there. They see it. We'll just bring it a little bit closer. Maybe, maybe kind of use it to tease them and see how they react to it and see if some of that fear goes away and see if they're able to kind of like push that for me to make me happy in that moment. So there's, there's a lot of these kind of little moments where I, I, I like to see how far they could go for me <laughs> and also drawing out things that they didn't know about themselves. I love that. It's almost like you're you're guiding them in in some ways or you're you're giving you're providing opportunities that could change course of their experience. Do you feel like you intentionally educate or you know teach clients about more more than they're coming for originally? Like you're obviously giving them opportunities to explore other things and you're you're laying groundwork for them to maybe take the session or or add something to the session that they didn't I guess properly communicate, but do you feel like you're also educating your clients, especially the newer ones that might be coming to you for the first time? If there is an education, it's never intentional. The way I like to see the play that happens is it's a dance, right? And if the dance goes into a spontaneous place, that's wonderful. We can both learn about ourselves. If the dance is a little bit more strict and, you know, it's it's a line dance or whatever then there's something really interesting about that too, around like the strictness of the rules. I think uh, if there's a newer sub who's like very, very new to it, like I've had some subs who are like 19, there's a longer talking portion to just make sure like they know what they're getting into and that their expectations are not uh, all 100% from, you know, porn they've seen online and just like managing some of those, uh, some of those like preconceptions. I love that you said managing expectations because I feel like just in business, like that is such a a huge component to running a successful business is like clearly communicating to your client, your fan, your subscriber, your submissive, like what the expectations will look like so that they're coming into whatever the exchange is with the right expectations. Because I think that's where so many businesses struggle even in our industry where it's like you know you're selling a custom but you didn't set expectations and now the fan who's receiving a custom piece of content from you thinks it's going to be x y and z because you maybe didn't communicate clearly and set or manage the expectation from the get-go and then there's this dissonance and you have this unhappy fan who's not going to come back and spend or you know this so oftentimes happens and i feel like managing expectations is such a good skill to have in business and that it's it translates across all the niches in our industry or, or, or any kind of business, really. So the fact that you said that, I think that's huge because I think that really impacts a business over time in a, in a large way. Yeah, I agree, especially because I ha- I do both digital work and in-person work now, right? I have some subs where they're like, I've seen I've seen this video of you like using this like gigantic 12-inch strap on this like one submissive. And they're like, I want this to happen. And I was like, okay, first of all, this man is a porn performer and he's been doing this for years, okay? This is your first time. You're not, you're barely going to get like a two inch strap into you. Like warm up or like hold your horses. It is not going to feel good for you. It's not going to have the desired effect if you, if you take that big one, you know, like let's, let's kind of hold your horses and figure out how to warm you up first. (laughs) Sometimes I think fans get caught up with the aesthetic of things. And I'm like, you just like the way this looks. You're not going to love the execution of how we get here. (laughs) Oh, yeah, absolutely not. (laughs) Although um, on my OnlyFans right now, um, I've been doing something new where there's a uh, the original cut of a video. And then I also have a second cut of a called a director's cut where I I leave in the parts where we're taking water breaks the parts where like me and the performer are talking 
for the people who like don't necessarily just want the fantasy right they want to see me kind of interacting with my performers in a very real way so i in that i now usually have two different video sets for for people like that and i think it's I think the future of porn is kind of in that direction. I think more and more people are less satisfied with only the fantasy and unrealistic expectations. So I think it's nice to balance it out, at least for my audience. I think you're a thousand percent correct in this. Like, there's so many performers that I've seen come up very quickly in the last couple years. And the pattern that I feel like I'm noticing across everyone is like the realness to their content or like the the very amateur, not overproduced, literally the opposite of how I make content, um, but the very like raw, real, um, unpolished and, and relatable stuff seems to be doing really, really well. So I, I think the industry is definitely moving in that direction. I, I would love to kind of know a little bit more about your career path and then also your career goals, because I'm curious, like when we enter this industry, obviously we're from different niches entirely, but there's always these challenges or these obstacles you kind of have to face and, and, you know, things you need to navigate. So in terms of your career path, what are the biggest challenges you felt like you had to face and kind of overcome? Um, I think when I moved to the digital space, um, it took me a while to figure out my workflow and to figure out how exactly I want to go about it. There's not a lot of resources out there, right? And like Sex Work CEO was like one of the resources I used when I started out because there was really no guide for how to approach this industry and also how to approach it in a way that's like very personal. A lot of the instructions I and a lot of the research I was reading up on upon was like start like you know use an agency if you're new and I just knew that wasn't really for me and recently I had a situation where I was like okay yeah I definitely do not think that is for me I I think one of the biggest challenges sometimes is for my specific niche I, I still have like a male dominated audience and I think for men who are subs uh, it's very hard for them to do it sustainably sometimes um, because of the nature of the content. And this is one of the things that was that I decided for myself was like, okay, this is probably not a commercially good business idea, but for subs who are like, hey, I, you know, I want to like focus on my life and focus on someone that I can do this in 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 a like real life capacity, I absolutely encourage it because um, I do think that like my role is like, I, I'm i kind of like an in-between person, right? For you to figure out where your kinks and fetishes are to play, figure out what you like. And I can also offer companionship and I can offer, you know, my time online via live streams. But at the end of the day, it's really important for you to find your own community. And I will, I want to build that community online, but that shouldn't be the only community you have. I think it's good for them to um, share it with a partner, right? Like share that with a partner that, hey, I like X, Y, Z and not have it be a secret. I think it's a lot more freeing when they don't keep it to themselves. And yeah, I, I guess it's a bigger like social issue around masculinity, but I, I think like having subs who really feel a lot of shame around their their kinks and fetishes and that's why relapses happen is is kind of hard to see sometimes. Yeah, for sure. Do you feel like because obviously the work that you do it's um it's kind of, it's a deep work. You're you're forming a lot of relationships, you're you're navigating a lot of personalities, a lot of dynamics like obviously this can be demanding in terms of a profession, I'm sure. Um do you, because this is a question, you know, I get asked all the time by CEO squad uh, or by just people in general, which is like, how do you balance it all? Like, how do you, you know, have a personal life and still meet the demands of your professional life? And I know every, this is such a unique uh, answer for every person. It's so different. Um, but for you, because like I said, you have like this, this depth of rapport with your submissives. How does that impact your balance in your personal life and in the dynamic you manage with yourself? Yeah, that's a good question. 
I had a bit of a burnout last year when I was moving digitally because it was such a fast transition. And I also hustled so hard to get it off the ground. And right now, I think a perk of having trust with my audience is if I say I'm going to be gone for a month and I'll be back, they'll be they'll wait for me. And they also respect that. I don't think I want an audience that continuously demands my attention and time in an unreasonable manner because I find that disrespectful and also don't want to give it to that kind of audience. So I think that being, being able to cultivate an audience that respects me and prioritizes me what well, helps me have a personal life and they want me to have a personal life um last year around may i took one whole month off and i i told a bunch of subs you know like hey i'm transitioning to digital i want a whole month off would you just like can i'm not going to return it with any like i'm not sessioning with you i'm not doing xyz with you like i just really want your support uh, and my whole month was funded just because they they respect me as a person, and that was really that was like really heartwarming to to have people like that in my life, and I always want to do right by them for that reason. Mm, and I also try to carve out personal time as much as possible. I went to the zoo this weekend. Uh, I try to have time with my like civilian vanilla friends just so that I can get my foot on the ground every now and then and i also have a big team at this point so that i can you know read a book and watch a movie and have time to myself in a measured way yeah the team aspect is is huge and i love that your your fan base and audience were able to support you like that's such a gift and it speaks about like it speaks volumes about the type of business you are running because you take that much care in in terms of the quality of services you're providing so that it's met and reflected back to you in those moments where where you really want to take the time like that's so beautiful the one thing that i think i would love to kind of discuss before we start to wrap up is i know there is we have a huge dom following here at sex work ceo um, which always surprises me. <laughs> but um, there's so many people that are either interested in be- becoming doms or expanding their brand into the dom space or the kink and, and fetish space. Is there advice that you would give to doms or aspiring doms listening in that y- you kind of wish you had when you first got started? Ooh, um, I would say don't copy another dom style. When I started, there were resources out there that were that was trying to train people into being a very specific kind of dominant or like how to talk like a dom right i think what's actually more important is taking time to yourself to figure out who you are as a person and what does your dominance look like when i started because of 2020 like findomi was kind of popular and i kind of like tried to adopt the bratty findom voice and it just didn't work out like I didn't know how to connect with people like that because I don't see people as wallets and there are some fantastic fandoms out there who see people as wallets and they know how to interact with people as wallets I do not have that style and I actually like fail pretty miserably when I interact with people like that and it took me like a few years to figure out like I I'm a playful dom you know who is pretty earnest about the work I like really weird kinky shit and I am really I'm a really hard sadist with people that I have built trust with. So I love kidnapping scenes. I love seeing, I don't know if this is allowed on this platform, but like B-L-O-O-D. Um, I love tears, right? And uh, I know that's not like the widest net of clientele, but that's who I am. And I want to attract the people like that to my circles. So don't feel obligated to copy someone else just because they are successful. What works for one person does not work for another person. And the more you lean into what makes you weird and unique in your identity, the the more you'll bring in people that resonate with that and will like really foster your own style and your own communication. I also think for someone starting out, be really careful of subs who weaponize BDSM language to take advantage of you if you're new, right? So be careful of subs who don't have a good understanding of their own boundaries and put that responsibility onto you to manage their emotional well-being. 
um, something that I had to learn uh, pretty early on, not just in the dungeon, but when I went independent, is knowing where your boundaries are in terms of emotional and em emotional involvement and stick to it and make sure that you're very clear about and you honor your own boundaries around your time around your emotional capacity around your relationships and making sure that you're in a place where no amount of money can tempt you out of your boundaries right if you say you want to take a weekend off if someone offers you 10k, you can turn that down and have savings so that you can have fuck you money <laughs> so that you can't say no to people because uh, we we are in an industry where sometimes like we'll control a little bit too much and to center your power and center the fact that, you know what, this Saturday is worth more than 10k because it's my time and my time cannot be bought and that's really, really important. I think that's fantastic advice and so much of what you have said so far in like this episode is a lot of like filtering out the people you actually want to attract to be your fan and to be your best, like a part of your audience and, and to be your submissives. Like, I think the the qualifier is really important. Like even for my own audience base, like I have, I keep a high subscription rate on my fan sites and that's not because I, I mean to be greedy or because I think I can get that rate. It's because I know the only people that will afford it and stick with me are people who have expendable income and who really, you know, gravitate towards my brand and my content. And I would much rather focus the limited time and attention I do have on fostering the relationships with those qualified fans than by having like a $3 recurring and having thousands of people on, the, on my pages that I'm trying to like build connection with. Like it's just not scalable to your earlier point as well. So I, I love when you talk about like, doing what is on brand for you, doing the things you like doing, that you gravitate towards the boundaries you actually have. And then it'll filter out kind of the the audience, the sub, the clientele that you are trying to attract. Because so many times I see performers and creators just trying to get everyone through the door or get everyone to subscribe. Or, but in reality, like you're also making more work for yourself. And then you're on this wheel that is very difficult to get out of and, and very difficult to say no to. Like to your point about having a weekend off and not being able to be bought away from that. Like that gets very hard if you're always chasing the next sale in that way. Yeah, I agree. I also think that's what leads to burnout, right? When you're spending like a long shoot day and you don't even like what you're creating anymore because your audience is demanding it. Like there's nothing worse than being trapped in a business structure that you do not like with people paying you that you also don't like. Like, I think that is the like worst possible situation for a business owner. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's also like being, being the brand or being the product because we are the ones offering the services. It's also such a hard, difficult, you know, business to run in and of itself. Like it's already complicated in that aspect that you are the thing that you're selling your time, your attention, your services. So like then to have to chase the, your tail about maintaining that business model at scale, it gets so difficult so quickly. So like to add any other complications or any other layers to that, it's just, oh my gosh, it, it sounds like torture. <laughs> I, I love everything that you've said here today tell me like this is so useful i know so many people listening are going to get so much value out of this episode is there anything that you would want to add before we wrap that you think uh is important for anyone listening to know or maybe we didn't get to touch on mm, i want to plug some amazing resources out there so if you're new i really love uh mistress shayla's seven days of domination she is a like amazing community member. She has a great heart and she has a lot of resources on her Patreon for people who want to learn about kinks and fetishes um, from real doms. Uh, Danielle Blunt, she has a fantastic, you know, YouTube uh, and a podcast where she talks about, uh, you know, different styles and really getting into like the kink community. Eva O, oh, she also recently launched a podcast too and she has a style where it's very centered around like her needs and I really I, I really admire the way that she does domination too so those three people are fantastic if you want to know more about the community and know more about uh, kinks and fetishes 
I love that. I love, love, love that. That those resources are going to live on to do so much good. Thank you so much, Tommy, for just taking the time. I know everyone listening is getting so much value from this. Um, is there, you know, socials that everyone can follow you at? Is there links that you want to drop and plug? Um, take it away and, and give them everything. <laughs> yeah. So my in-person uh, Twitter is this MX Tommy. Uh, in the bio is my digital Twitter, mxtomi.digital. I recently launched my personal clip site, it is, it, and it is just one phase out of three. And I launched my personal clip site because there's a lot of censorship in this industry, right? Um, I recently did a fisting thing. I can't fist anyone on OnlyFans, but that's going to drop on my clip site. So my clip site is going to be where I shoot all of my most extreme content kidnapping impact you know nice play all of the like weird wacky stuff that the algorithm hates <laughs> it's going to be on my clip site so if you want to see weird stuff it's going to be there and that site is going to expand to a fan site and uh, i will be able to live stream on it too in the upcoming uh i think probably in the next year or two and it's going to be where i really have my uh, foot in and really express some of my creativity um, my OnlyFans is where I'm most active right now, and that is uh, at MX Tommy. This is my one year July anniversary, so I'm doing like seven live streams. Um, I bought a bunch of NeuroGel for this like crazy bathtub stream where I'm covering myself in it, doing like a chastity JOI. I'm doing splashing, you know, I'm going to be a online a lot more this month. So if you're interested, you want to play, you want to talk to me, make it there. If you're financially able to pay my full subscription rate, I'm also going to be uh, doing a crowdfund where some of my subs will be paying for your subscription so that people who can't make it in still make it in just because they want everyone to see my content and hang out with me. I love that. That's genius. That's such an awesome way to crowdsource subscriptions and, and submissives. That's fantastic. Thank you again, Tommy, for, for everything, for making the time. I know your time's super valuable and we really, really appreciate you coming on. Thank you. Have a good rest of your day. You as well. We're going to wrap up this space here. So for those still listening, as many of you guys have seen, we have been putting out a ton of new content over on our YouTube channel. So if you're not already subscribed to us on YouTube, please do so at youtube.com forward slash SWCEO. Make sure you have the notifications bell turned on so that you never miss a video. In our latest vlog series we just dropped, we focus on how I had to sell my sports cars to cover some overdue taxes, a very real and relatable event. Um, also sharing some health news and then celebrating the launch of the CEO Society. As always, I want to say a huge thank you to everyone who subscribed to us in our Telegram bot already. If you haven't already heard, we released a Telegram bot that essentially sends out your daily content inspiration and captions for everything you need, your PPV locked messages, your clip stores, etc. The ideas are trendy and highly desirable for what fans are currently seeking, and the captions are optimized with calls to action so that you increase your earning and unlock potential with each one. The Telegram bot pushes your daily dose of inspiration to your phone every day around 10 a.m. Central so that you no longer have to waste time researching, planning, or coming up with content ideas or captions. The bot takes care of all of it. And if you're not an active Telegram user, but you would like PDF downloadable versions of the content inspo and captions, you can now get that over on our shop at sexworkceo.com forward slash shop. A while back, we launched the store on our website with PDF downloads of the same content inspo and captions that get featured in our Telegram bot. We also have additional downloads available for you there as well. Things like an unlock sales script, overcoming sales objections scripts, anything you need to help you close the deal with fans and PPVs. And if you want to get a taste of that without spending a dime, we have completely free PDFs there waiting for you to download as well. So if you're interested, head on over to sexworkceo.com forward slash shop and get those if you're interested. I do want to take this last opportunity to draw your attention and remind all of you listening about SWR, my other company. So in case you're not yet familiar, SWR Data is on a mission to survey adult creators like you. We want to hear your feedback about the challenges you face and how the adult industry can better serve your needs. Our goal is to collect your experiences, opinions, and observations about the current state of the adult industry. We'll then use this data for necessary changes to try to make it a better place for us, the creators. 
the reality is that a lot of the people in power have never been creators and they just simply don't have the lens to know what our needs are. SWR data is that lens. However, I can't do it alone. We genuinely need your help. And for that reason, we're inviting any creator who's willing to participate in our qualifying survey, which helps us understand your expertise as an adult creator. And then by taking that survey, you can start to participate in future paid surveys. Our experience as creators is super valuable, and I know that we should get paid for it. This is a collective effort, so if you're interested in participating and getting paid for future surveys, comment on it to let us know that you're interested, and we will DM you the qualifying survey link so that you can join us in this mission. Lastly, but most importantly, I want to emphasize that all the info we put out here, we do so for free because we believe in this idea that the more financially successful creators are, the more resources we'll have as a community to do things like lobby Congress, impact policy, organize, and more. So if you found value in the content you heard here today or the tweets that you've engaged with, please, please, please consider sharing this to your own profiles to make this journey easier for your own adult creator friends. Our only ask is that you retweet our stuff so we can all help as many people as humanly possible. That's gonna bring us to the end of today's Twitter space. Huge thank you to everyone who joined us here. And remember, all of these get turned into blog posts and are available over on our website, sexworkceo.com. So thank you again for joining me today, CEO Squad, and I will see you all a week from now. It would be absolutely incredible if you rated this podcast five stars and left a little review. We want to get this podcast to as many adult creators as possible, and you taking a second to leave a couple stars and a review really helps us do that. Thanks so much.